Thank you, thank you everybody for joining us today and welcome to today's CNCF webinar, Calico Networking with EBPF. I'm Taylor Wagoner, the CNCF Operations Analyst, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We would like to welcome our presenters today, Chris Hodge, Developer Advocate for Project Calico, and Sean Crampton, Core Developer for Project Calico. Before we get going, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, so please feel free to drop your questions in there rather than the chat window, and we'll get to as many of those as we can at the end. This is an official CNCF webinar, and as such, is uh, subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct, so please do not add anything to the chat or to the Q&A that would be in violation of our Code of Conduct. So basically, please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. Uh, please note that the recording and slides for today's webinar will be posted um, to the CNCF webinar page uh, this afternoon at uh, cncf.io slash webinars. With that, I will hand it over to Sean and Chris for today's presentation. Hi there, good day everybody, and thanks for joining us. Um, this is, uh, today we're going to be talking about Calico networking with uh, eBPF. Um, and we're going to cover a lot during the presentation. Um, it's, it's a pretty exciting feature that we just unveiled um, a few days ago with the latest Calico 3.13 release. And so we're, we're pretty excited to, to be talking about it and to, uh, and, and to share the what's and the whys of eBPF networking with you. Um, so if we uh, go on to the next slide, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and speaking with us today is going to be uh, Sean Crampton, who is uh, one of the core developers on this feature. And so he has a tremendous amount of knowledge about uh, the implementation and how it works and the benefits from it. And so we're going to have a little bit of a Q&A session with him so that he can talk about um, why, you know, why we implemented this and, and how it works. Um, and so, uh, welcome, Sean. Uh, for the first question, what prompted the team to add another data plane to Calico? So, um, from the very beginning, um, we designed Calico with with kind of pluggable data planes in mind. Um, our general kind of philosophy on this is like we want to use the best tool for the job. So, um, when we first started with Calico, um, we went for tried and true technologies. Um, we went for standard Linux networking with IP tables. We use BGP in our, in our networking um, side because that's, uh, uh, that's kind of proven at internet scale. Um, and that, that's kind of great for a lot of, a lot of use cases. And, and as I say, kind of, it's great if you want to stick with, with kind of tried and true technologies and, and you're fairly conservative. Um, then along came um, uh, Windows, and we added a, uh, a a second data plane. So, so we've got our second pluggable data plane, um, Windows HNS based, and that's in our um, commercial offering on on top of Calico. Um, but one of the things is that the best tool for the job is not a static a static thing, and there's been a lot of um, innovation going on in the kernel, um, the the Linux kernel in this case. Um, and one of the things that they've been adding um, is, is this eBPF technology. Um, and it's kind of reached the point where it's, it's starting to be useful. It's starting to be deployed. And, and um, we think it's, it's uh, worth investing in now, um, where, where before we'd, we'd stuck with the more conservative choices. Um, on the other side, like there's a lot of enterprises who are out there who are not going to want to run the latest kernels with the the bleeding edge uh, technology in it, and and for those we have the you know tried and true technology that we that we had there already, um, and yeah, we just want to future proof Calico and make sure that um, that we're we're ready as as the technology develops and we're still using the best tool for the job. <clears throat> okay, so so eBPF is a is a new technology that's inside of the Linux kernel. But uh, you know, being new, there may be people who haven't heard about it or you know know the the, the power that it has. So, what exactly is eBPF? Right. Yeah. So um, so I can I can go over that. Um, so eBPF um, it's it's a technology that lets you run kind of 
little mini programs inside the kernel and, and they run when things happen in the kernel. So it's, it's kind of event driven. Um, I, there's been a bit of hype around it, um, but the, the, the big idea is that you can write a program, um, compile it to eBPF byte code. So it, it's a virtual machine, a bit like a Java virtual machine or something like that, if, you, if you're familiar with that. And then you load it into the kernel and you don't, um, uh, you, you don't need to uh, give it all kinds of permissions. Um, so when you load it into the kernel, the, um, the kernel verifies that that code is safe. So it verifies that it can't go off and access arbitrary kernel memory or um, uh, like panic your kernel or, or like blow something up. Um, the eBPF program is, is kind of verified to make sure that it can only do a certain range of things and it, it's verified to make sure it can't tight loop or, or kind of run forever. It has to, has to terminate and, and it's kind of limited in that way. Um, uh, but um, another, another aspect is it's verified to make sure it, it can only call certain helper functions. So um, uh, your, your BPF code can do calculations, but if it wants to kind of affect the environment or affect the world around it, it has to go through a helper. Those are all policed. And so it's quite a lockdown environment, but it runs all the way in the kernel where um, it can run very, very fast. It's all kind of um, compiled down to real machine code when you load it in. Um, and it doesn't have to jump between user mode and kernel mode to do things. It, it, can, it can run right at full speed inside the kernel in, in a kind of very streamlined way. Um, uh, I talked about compilation and, and the technology we're using to, to kind of build our BPF programs. Um, we're writing them in C and then compiling them down with um, the Clang compiler. So um, Clang now has a backend that, that targets eBPF and, and generates these bytecode programs. So yeah, big, big idea is we can run little mini programs inside the kernel. They can run fast and they can do interesting things that um, like make different decisions than what the kernel might do um, on its own and, and bypass things that the kernel might, might do that were taking, taking a longer time. Um, that so that's, that's the, that's the yeah, idea. That, yeah. That, sounds, that sounds really cool. Um, uh, so when you when you have these eBPF programs, what what sort of things can you do with them? Like what what's the power that it unlocks for 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 developers and users? Yeah, so it's it's um, it's quite a broad set of uh, set of features. Um, so uh, the the original purpose of of um, BPF, like before it was eBPF, which is extended um, BPF, if I remember correctly. Um, there, there was BPF, which was, was designed for filtering packets and it's used by TCP dump. If you've ever used that program. Um, so TCP dump loads in a program that says, give me these packets and they get sent up to user space. That was the original, original, um, idea behind it, I think. Um, but then once that technology was in there and the virtual machine was in there, it got extended and it expanded with, with additional features and the modern variant, um, it, has become quite powerful. Uh, one, one use case in there is, um, is security. So uh, it got some use for set comp filters. So those allow you to police um, various thing, uh, various operations that um, user space programs can do with the kernel. So they call, make a syscall into the kernel and, and you can police what files that syscall is allowed to access or what you know, what the parameters to that are allowed to be. Um, and your, your BPF program would run on the data that was passed to the kernel and you could decide, is this okay or not? Um, another aspect is um, logging and tracing. Um, so there's a very flexible um, set of hooks inside the kernel where you can basically hook a, a very large percentage of the functions in the kernel um, and run a little bit of code that kind of snoops on what that function is doing. It can't really affect what the function is doing, but it can snoop on it and record some information that you can pick up later. Um, so you can, you could record how long that function took, or you could record, um, like what the arguments to the function were. Um, and people are using that for all kinds of exciting things. Um, but it's, it's kind of 
not not exactly what we're doing. Um, and the the sort of next class of things is 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 kind of the meat of what we're we're doing. So uh, network routing and and packet filtering. So there's some some very like um, specific hooks in the kernel that are designed especially for um, doing uh, networking operations. So we have hooks where um, uh, where packets are being processed and we get handed the packet data so we can inspect it and and decide what to do with it. Um, some very uh, some very powerful helper functions in those um, those hooks that allow us to do uh, quite powerful things. So yeah, it's it's a very broad technology and there's lots of exciting things going on in the ecosystem. We're focused on that networking side of it. Okay, so you, so you have this really powerful technology at your hands, and you also have an existing data plane that is very highly regarded and provides all sorts of features. So when you have these two and you're bringing them together, how do you figure out what to build um, and, and what's your design and development process? Right, yeah, so, oops, went uh, too far, I think. Um, so uh, I guess um, we, we didn't just want to kind of, um, I guess, jump on the bandwagon and slap eBPF on the, on the, um, the product. We actually went back to back to um, back to basics and kind of uh, evaluated a whole range of technologies. Um, so uh, the various um, various ways where we wanted to improve on the the previous data plane. So we went um, we went and we looked at various different types of eBPF approach. We looked at um, whether we could use um, the XDP hooks, which are um quite exciting and some some uh, projects use those so so facebook had a project that was using that that's a, an ebpf hook that can run all the way down in the network card and that one's that one's pretty exciting so we looked at that we looked at the traffic control ebpf hooks so the tc layer if, if you're familiar with those tools um, we looked at um, getting involved in uh, socket processing as well um, we also compared that to nf tables with so the current the current uh, you know, standard Linux um, data plane for, for Calico uses IP tables and NF tables is kind of the version two of IP tables. So we, we um, investigated that. Um, and we also looked at um, different networking approaches as well. So IPv LAN versus our current, current approach, which is using uh, VETH devices. Um, we built a bunch of prototypes and we spent a few months uh, digging into uh, the performance of those those different prototypes, um, and we found that we found some surprises there. So, NF tables, uh, so IP tables version two is generally quite a bit slower than IP tables, which was disappointing. Um, I think they they you know it's it's a kind of version one of the version two, and they're still working on the performance. Um, so the the main driver for building NF tables wasn't really performance; it was it was the API complexity and so on, and they wanted to improve that. So we've still got some work to do on the, the performance there. Um, we looked at XDP because it has this exciting like hardware offload capability of it can run all the way in the network card if if supported. Um, but we found that had a lot of um, a lot of corner cases that come with it. So if you have exactly the right hardware and you're doing exactly what it's designed for, then um, you can you can push millions of packets per second, and it's it's fantastic. But if you're if you're needing to interwork with um, uh, the various other things that that we were using, so uh, VET devices for the the pod networking and and the like, then we were find, we found that that was it came out slower, or it had it it had issues where you had mismatches between the, the type of XDP that was supported on different devices and things like that. And, and that, that um, made that prototype very hard to, to get going. So um, we ended up settling on the, um, the TC BPF hooks, which seem to be the most, uh, the most mature. Um, so those allow us to run uh, BPF programs on packets quite early in the pipeline. So the, the packet arrives and, and a buffer gets allocated for it and then our program gets to run and we get to inspect the packet and decide what we do with it. They're also quite powerful so we can we can do things like redirect the packet if we want to um, uh, 
bypass a bunch of the kernel's processing. We can have a packet come in and redirect it out of another interface if we've, if we've kind of figured out that we have a fast path for that particular packet. So a lot of this is about finding fast paths where the, where the majority of packets can take some kind of fast path, but then we fall back to the normal kernel processing um, if, if that doesn't work for, for the particular packet. Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, we spent, spent a few months um, building towards having a, having a sort of consistent design. Um, I, I mentioned um, IPv LANs. Um, another surprise that we had there was IPv LANs were way slower than we thought they were going to be. Like we thought that was a, an interesting technology to, to check out for, for pod networking. Um, but we tested it on um, like a kernel in the 415 sort of range. And it turned out there'd been a massive performance regression and, and it, it was really, really slow. And that wasn't fixed until a, a really recent kernel. So we, we, got, we got put off that one and, and then um, like maybe we'll look into it again later when uh, now it's back to, to performing reasonably. <laughs> okay, so, so you spent a couple months considering the options, considering performance requirements. Um, and, and I imagine that, you know, if you, if you put that much work into it, that, you know, it's not just like, a, you know, a complete line for line replacement for the existing implementation. So, so exactly what are the differences, you know, from, from, the, from the eBPF in, implementation and the, the traditional Linux networking implementation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, like, first of all, I think the key thing to note is we're aiming for the same user experience. So you define your, your policy in the same way. Um, we, we've kept the same routed approach to, to networking. So we use the Linux routing table um, still. Um, if, you're, if you're using Calico's like um, uh, networking, like ver Calico's various networking modes like BGP or IPIP or VXLAN, they work the same way with routed, um, uh, root, routing the traffic around um, and the, the scalability and the kind of calculation engine is all the, all the same um, with, with the new data plane. Well, that's, that's where we want to be for, for GA. Uh, we haven't, haven't tested to sort of full scale yet, I would say, just, just a little caveat. Um, so we want to keep a lot of that the same, but basically I, I sort of alluded to it before, but we're, we're looking for um, fast paths where we can pick up a packet early, we can spot that this packet is um, destined for a particular pod or this packet is going to a service or, or whatever it is. And we can say, rather than sending it through layer after layer of um, like IP tables and the, and the, the normal Linux stack, um, we'll just take that packet and we'll, we'll fast path it to some, some other destination. So um, if it's a local pod packet, we'll check have we have we already done a policy calculation to verify that this flow is is good to go um, with our, our networking policy and if it is then we'll we'll just redirect that packet directly to the VETH and we'll skip a whole bunch of processing in the middle so that that's the kind of um, the goal here is to sort of maintain the outward appearance um, speed up things with fast paths and then also to, to try and improve some of the behavior um, uh, that, that, we, that was suboptimal as well. So um, one of the things that we found fairly early on is when we combine some of Calico's, um, like Calico's like unique features, like we, we support host endpoint policy and things like that, um, where you, you can secure your host, um, I think, calling that micro segmentation, people are familiar with that, uh, that term, where you can secure your host as well as your workloads, your, your pods and Kubernetes. Um, when you combine those two, we were kind of pushed in a particular direction with our, with our design. And that led us to think that we uh, to, to need to take over some responsibility from Kube proxy as well. Um, so we actually, we're sort of forced into implementing um, a, a re-implementation of Kube proxy. And then we thought, how can we improve on that? So we've managed to improve on some of the aspects and some of the pain points of Kube proxy, particularly when you put it with network policy, um, which have, have tripped up users in the past. So, so we've, we've tried to keep the, the sort of good things about Calico's uh, data plane, 
where we've where we've taken over from Cube Proxy, we've tried to improve on on the behavior there. Um, and uh, I, yeah, the the remaining point to say is we do need quite a new kernel to do some of the things that we're doing. So okay, um, we've targeted kernel five point three in this in this release. Okay, so you have a newer kernel. You have a virtual machine that is helping you prioritize the the fast path. And you've rewritten Cube Proxy. <laughs> so with all of this work behind you, um, what improvements does it actually bring? Like, are you are you are you seeing performance improvements? Are you you know what are the what are the benefits of eBPF over the the traditional data plane? Yeah, and just um, just to flag up when you say we re we rewritten Cube Proxy, I think we we've, we've tried to keep as much common code with the other okay. Cube Proxy as possible. So. We, we really hate like re-implementing something. Um, we, we much prefer to kind of stay, uh, stay compatible with, with other things, but it, it's that combination of um, needing to support features like host endpoints that are um, not actually implemented yet in the, in the, in the release that we okay. have yet, but, but they're required by the design. We sort, of, we sort of got forced into it, but then we thought if we're gonna do it, let's, let's this do what we, do what we can do, yeah. So it's less a re-implementation and more of a custom optimization based on yeah. the the uh, um, the the changes that are that, that are needed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we've, okay, we've we've kind of got a different data plane for Cube Proxy, but the Cube uh -huh. Proxy like calculation is is shared code with with okay. upstream Kubernetes. Yeah. All right. So it's so it's still so it's still okay. That's uh that's that's that that's great to know. Um, so what improvements does it all bring? Like what's the, what's the final outcome and result of this? So, yeah. So, uh, one of the, um, one of the improvements is, um, throughput. Um, so, um, we did some testing on a, a pair of, um, physical machines in our lab, um, with back to back 40 gig links. Um, um, this, this is just fairly simple testing. We used a tool called QPerf, which is mostly, um, single threaded and it's it's you know somewhat optimized but it's not like uh it's not totally pushing the limits i would say um but we found that when you have these optimizations in and you have the have the fast paths in there um we're getting higher throughput with a, a single threaded test like qperf and if we measure the cpu usage per packet where we're using less cpu and quite significantly less in uh, when you're dealing with small packets, so if you're if you're in a data center and you're doing mostly east-west traffic and your MTU is a nice you know nine thousand or something like that, um, so you can push really big packets, then the difference is fairly small. So that's the that's the graphs on the on the right of the of the the picture here. So um, MTU um, we were testing with eight eight nine four zero because that's that's the MTU of our hardware. Um, you, you get a, a small improvement, but if you if you're pushing internet size packets, so you know um, small 15 1500 byte packets, then um, the reduced CPU per packet and and bypassing a bunch of that that logic does give you a higher throughput, um, at least with a single threaded test. But but whether it's single threaded or not, you're seeing lower CPU usage for your your networking stack, which is which is a win for for any, um, uh, at pretty much any workload, I think. Um, so that's one advantage. Um, the other one with our cube proxy implementation. Um, so there's three lines here. Um, what we're, what we're measuring here is the TCP handshake time to a, um, to a service. So if you, if you run like curl, um, to curl an nginx pod, that's, I think that's how we collected these numbers. So you're just doing a simple curl test, but you tell it to um, you you pass the verbose argument and tell it to um, log out all the detailed connection statistics. So the first thing that happens in a TCP connection is you have one packet there and, and one packet back, and then an acknowledgement that um, like forms the TCP handshake. And the um, the the TCP handshake pays quite a high price for when you're doing load balancing because um, when you when you send that first packet, it has to do a load balancing calculation to figure out which backend do I send this to, 
and then it stores that in in the connection tracking table so the next packet doesn't pay much of a price so what we're trying to measure here is that first packet latency um, or the, the handshake latency so a packet in each direction and for ip tables cube proxy um, what you see is that as the number of services goes up then the latency goes up linearly and that's just due to the the implementation of ip tables so you just have a linear set of rules that say if it's this uh, service then do this if it's this other service then do this if it's this service do that um, and the more services you have the more rules you have to traverse to find the service that you're looking for um, so the the longer it takes for that first packet subsequent packets flow really fast on on all the data planes because the the connection tracking kicks in um, but one of the things that the um, cube proxy IPVS mode was designed to address is, is that issue where you have more services means more latency. And we do pretty well on this too. So um, we've, in this, in this particular test, come out slightly ahead of even IPVS cube proxy where, um, you know, we're shaving fractions of a millisecond off that. Um, and then if you have lots of services, then IPVS or, or RBPF data plane are way better than, um, than IP tables cube proxy. That said, um, the, the top of this graph is 1.5 milliseconds. So if you have 10,000 services, you're paying a millisecond cost, but your, your latency across the internet might be 100 milliseconds. So um, it, depending on your use case, you may or not notice this kind of thing, but it, but it is a nice, a nice win that we get that, get that number as low as possible. Um, okay. So yeah, that's that one. Um, I, another another nice feature is um, the uh, the way we update the data plane um, for BPF um, has the it can be more efficient than than IP tables and IPVS. So um, just the the kernel APIs that we use to update. IP tables, IPVS, and BPF are, are all quite different. And the um, uh, IP tables cube proxy um, uses quite a lot of CPU, um, like measuring across the whole host. So including like the, the kernel CPU and the IP tables program itself. Um, it uses quite a lot of CPU to do its updates. So in this test, we set up 5,000 services and then we churned the service um, uh, added and removed the service, I think. So each time the service gets added and removed, it causes, causes some CPU usage in the, um, in the control plane and the data plane. When you add that all up, um, IP tables cube proxy and IPVS cube proxy use quite a bit of CPU, whereas updating the BPF um, data structures in the kernel is quite a bit more efficient. Um, we can do very precise little delta updates to the, to the um, uh the information in the kernel um yeah, that, that the bpf programs are working with so we we're kind of very low and it's sort of in the noise versus the the cpu right. usage of, of yeah the, the tables. yeah the smoothing of that cpu spike is 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 quite noticeable <laughs> it's 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 something there yeah um so i i think it it came out even a little bit better than we were expecting on this one um i was expecting ipvs to be um pretty low in the noise as well. I, I think there might still be a few inefficiencies in the implementation in, in, Kube, in Kubernetes, because IPVS has quite a, quite a good API to the kernel, but I think maybe it's doing a little bit more work than it needs to do, mm. um, but our data plane's not. Okay. Um, so there's that. Um, the next thing, um, so there are a couple of pain points in, um, like service load balancing and, and so on with, with Kube proxy, particularly when you bring in policy. Um, so one of those is that when a packet comes in from outside the cluster, if it's going to a node port or a, a service cluster IP, you often lose the, um, the source IP of the traffic. Um, so that was one thing that we wanted to address. Um, and uh, that, Losing the source IP is bad for your logs, but it's also bad for policy because you know what's the first thing people want to do with policy on their nginx 
um, you know, uh, pod, they want to lock it down so only these IPs can access it. Um, and and in um, uh, the the standard data plane, like to to do that with um, with Calico, you have to um, you have to get into having host policy, and you have to get that traffic before um, before it reaches cube proxy and IP tables and everything. Um, so we, we kind of have support for that. But wouldn't it be nice if the source IP was preserved all the way to the pod? So that was one one thing that we wanted to do. Um, and wouldn't it be nice if we um, uh, did our best to remove any extra network hops um, to to speed up the speed up the traffic on on these paths? Um, so we were we were able to do that. So you have um, uh, on the left you have the kind of cube proxy data plane where an external client coming in um, goes to, it's accessing a node port. It arrives on one host. That's not the right host. It, the the host that has the backing pod is a different host. So it has to send that packet off and then the packet has to come, the response packet has to come all the way back to that first host and then, and then be redirected back out again. Um, with, with BPF, we can kind of do more clever, like customized things. Um, so this, this is the kind of um, the aspect of BPF where we can make different decisions to the kernel. So, with BPF, we can send that packet, and and we have a few ways of of sending it. Um, right now, we're using a, a a tunnel, so we send that packet on to the right host, and then that host can can um, uh, grab the packet and send it to the relevant pod. And if your network supports it, we can send the response all the way back to the external client from that second host. So instead of having four hops through the network you've only got three hops and, and we could out that return and back to the original host. Um, so that, that improves your latency and it re reduces your CPU because you're not spending two amounts of CPU on that first host, you're only spending one. So that's a, that's a nice uh, improvement. When we look at the, the performance, like, um, we were able to measure this. So we again measured the connect time to a service um, and in this case, it was an Nginx pod again. So we were doing um, curl and we were getting a, a trivial response back, just the hello world page. So the time to get the hello world page, like the total time with IP tables cube proxy was 1.5 milliseconds. And we've managed to get that down to one millisecond um, with the, the direct return uh, approach there. Okay. <clears throat> cool. That's pretty exciting. Um, so how can we try it out? Uh, I, um, you know, what's, what's the best way to get started, you know, playing with this and, 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 you know, kind of using it for yourself. Yeah. So, um, a, a key thing to stress is, um, this is a technology preview at this stage. So it, it takes a while to like really harden a data plane and put it through its paces. Um, so we don't want people using this in production. Um, but if you do want to try it out, um, we've got a link to the, uh, the documentation there and there's a how-to guide that will tell you what sort of system to set it up on. As I said, there's, there's a requirement for a new kernel um, and we, we did our testing on particular platforms. So we're steering people to the same platforms that we used for now. Um, and then you'll hopefully have the best experience if you, if you want to try this out. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's how you try it out. Great. So, so what's next? Like, what's what 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 are, what are what are the community's plans for you know the con continued development of this of this new feature? Yeah. So, um, the first thing to do is like we want to drive up the um, uh, like the the quality and the robustness. So we have a few like known gaps, including some security gaps. So like really don't use it in production, um, and a few a few rough edges kinds of things. Um, right now it relies on like having a fixed MTU. We need to get rid of that. Um, we haven't implemented IPv6 support yet. Um, but yeah, we're moving towards our GA release and, and looking at um, uh, knocking off those, uh, those rough edges, implementing the missing, missing features. Um, we did want to, um, to cover a pretty broad base in this first tech preview, because one of the dangers with releasing this kind of thing is if you optimize the hot path, but you haven't implemented enough of the rest of it, then you might 
you might have something that only works for that one case. So we've tried to implement quite a broad swathe of Calico features, um, but there's a there's a few things that we didn't get to in this in this tech preview release. So um, that's where we are. Um, yeah, GA release uh, hopefully coming soon, and we welcome your feedback. Uh, the, you know, I'm sure with with something of this size, there's bound to be bugs and and corner cases that we haven't hit in our testing yet. And we're, as I say, we're beefing up our testing and and improving that as we go towards GA. So do if you if you hit something funny or you have like a packet that's unexpectedly slow or gets dropped or whatever, then reach out to us. We we really uh, want to know about any any corner cases that we've missed. Um, Apart from that, um, we'll be bringing this through into Calico Enterprise at some point. Um, so the, the enterprise version of Calico, um, that requires more features to be implemented in the data plane to, to support the enterprise features as well. Okay. Cool. So, well, thanks, Sean, for answering the questions and talking about both eBPF and, and Calico's uh, data plane implementation of it. Um, we're going to get to the questions uh, that people have asked in just a moment. Um, but before we do that, project, I want to remind everyone that Project Calico is open source. Um, we, you know, there's a, there's a large community of people who are, who are using it and there are tons of ways that you can get engaged. Um, if we don't answer your questions here and you want to talk with us about, um, how you get started with it, how you use it. Um, you know, you know, I, as a developer advocate, I'm here to help people, uh, you know, get involved in the community. Um, so we have a Twitter channel, um, a, uh, this is all open source over on GitHub. You can talk to us directly on, uh, you know, the rest of the community on the Slack channel. And we've also launched a new, a new discourse um, uh, for, for people that, you know, for community members to ask questions on and help each other out with. Um, so with that, uh, we'll move on to the questions. Um, our first one is from a Adam Dunst Dunstan, who asks, um, who says, who asks, IP tables has a high level of visibility for troubleshooting and is well understood. Well, moving to this include new tools um, uh, uh, to be able to debug these bike, these new bytecode programs in the data path. Yeah, so that's something we're very conscious of. Um, so as we've gone along, we've had to build tools um, to to help us um, debug the debug the data plane. Um, I don't think we've packaged those up yet, but we we have them uh, we have them kind of ready to go, um, and they allow you to dump the state of the data plane out. Um, you can also turn on really detailed debug logging in the um, uh, for the BPF programs. So um, once you turn that on, basically you can get information about every decision that's made about every packet. Um, and we'll be working on that to, to um, I, th I think the main problem we have with that at the moment is it's a fire hose. So I think we'll be working on that to uh, limit it down so you can say log these packets for me, but but don't log every packet. Um, I think maybe we need some BPF on our BPF to, um, to control which uh, filters you get. Okay. Um, another question, um, uh, which, which, which I think re re reiterates a, a point that we covered earlier, um, is Calico replacing cube proxy? Um, it's, uh, it's, it, and if I, if, I under, if I understand that correctly, that we are, th that the Project Calico is um, not replacing cube proxy, but um, using the existing code and extending it. Yeah, exactly. So we've, um, we've kind of imported the cube proxy business logic and we've implemented an alternative proxy implementation. Um, so our proxy or implementation programs our data plane instead of IP tables, um, just in the same way that there's an IP tables one and there's an IPVS one. Um, we wondered about whether we could um, do it as something we could upstream. Um, but one of the things that's quite difficult with BPF programs at the moment is attaching multiple to one interface and making them all work together. Um, so we didn't have a good uh, a good first idea for how to how to split up the cube proxy function from the calico function and have them work together nicely. So the the load balancing function is in, uh, integrated into our BPF programs, and then we have this small shim that programs the uh, programs our data plane from that. Okay. Um, 
so uh, Christopher Luciano asks, there was talk of the IP tables maintainers creating a new BP filter to handle lots of the problems with scalability in the current implementation. Uh, does any no one know what the status of this is and would it change things with the Calico implementation? Um, so I, I investigated BP filter um, as one of the one of the things that was out there at the start. Um, as far as I could tell, it was still in the prototype stage. I believe that the companies that were behind it may have some private demos where they've done more. Um, but um, I think maybe BP filter is a little bit of a misnomer as well. So the, the actual technology they put in the kernel was a way for the kernel to um, call out to a user space program to do some work on behalf of the kernel. But there was a huge amount of work that still needed to be done in the kernel in order to, um, to come close to replacing IP tables with BPF in, in that way. Um, so they needed you know, a dozen extra um, BPF hooks in the, in the places where IP tables hooks into. Um, and then a huge amount of work in, in the user space uh, portion as well to, to, to implement the, um, the uh, BPF compilation engine and so on. So uh, the, the project was kind of a prototype stage and I, I don't think it's matured yet. Um, I'm also, I think, I think there was some tension in the kernel maintainers, like there were some people who were very pro it and then the IP tables developers uh, wanted to do NF tables instead, and that was their answer. So uh, I don't know how the politics plays out in the kernel, but there were, um, I, I got the impression there was some some politics and some difference of opinion, but but I'm not not sure. <laughs> okay, um, we're going back to some some performance questions from uh, 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 Daniel Veras. Verasami, um, can you provide more details about CPU usage and um, and um, MPPS um, and how does it compare with uh, DPDK? I don't think we've done uh, the next level of detail on on those numbers. Um, so I I would expect uh, DPDK still to be uh, faster, um, but DPDK is very uh, uh, like it requires you to re-architect your program in to, to use DPDK and use all of that user space stuff. I think DPDK gets in even earlier in the stack. It's more like um, uh, more like XDP, but it it requires a lot more um, a lot more integration in your application. So we're we're really going for a, a general purpose uh, data plane for Kubernetes. So um, uh, DPDK is not really the right technology for us to use because uh, it needs to be implement, uh, integrated into individual programs. Okay. Um, so how how does the uh, um, how does BPF play on a, on a locked kernel like like one that Red Hat would provide? Um, so there are there's only one or two kind of things that are locked down with BPF right now. So you can lock down the BPF system call completely um, and stop it from operating, um, at least outside of the, um, the, host, uh, the host namespace, which is where Calico runs. Um, basically, you need, to allow, uh, uh, you need to allow Calico to, to do its BPF operations if you want to use our BPF data plane. Um, that's just... Uh, Part and parcel of using this feature uh, it's, it's the usual usual answer with um, with a lockdown kernel. Like if we're using a feature that you've locked down, then we can't use it. So um, you can uh, reconfigure your kernel not to not to lock that down, um, or you can uh, use one of our other data plane modes if if you want it locked down and it's not right for you. Okay. Um, another another question from 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 daniel um uh and this 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 comes back to kind of the, the extended features of ebpf um are we able to have improved telemetry capabilities with ebpf without performance penalty um so that's that's certainly um one of the one of the hopes that we'll we'll be able to add uh using using this new technology um so bpf 
Um, it's, it's one of the things that BPF is designed to do well is to efficiently um, update, um, you know, counters and, and um, uh, send trace events up to, up to user space for us to collect that kind of thing. Um, so certainly, um, certainly one of the, one of the possibilities for this. Yes. Okay. Um, I, a, uh, a, a quick question about is eBPF the default or do I need Calico to activate it? Um, uh, the, the, uh, um, so the, the answer to that question is, is, is it's a tech preview and it's not enabled by default, but, but we have documentation that, that guides you through enabling it, um, on a newer kernel. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, it's a configuration parameter. Um, we've actually shipped a, um, a dedicated manifest that sets all of the, um, sets all the configuration parameters, um, for you. So rather than rather than having to set a few configuration parameters to enable it and make sure that you know MTU lines up and all that kind of stuff, we've just um, we've put a manifest on our docs website that you can apply instead of the normal calico.yaml, you would apply the calico bpf.yaml, um, and then it would go in BPF mode. Um, I think the the main issue is if your kernel isn't new enough, then it will try to to start up the BPF data plane and and uh, fail to do so if if you tried to apply it on on a, an older kernel. Okay, uh, Arjit uh, uh, asks. Um, I don't know if I understand the question entirely, so help me help me clarify if I if I get this wrong. Um, but it was said that the MTU size is fixed in Calico. Uh, uh, do we not keep the size x minus 20 to 50 to keep the mtu size and so so um yeah just uh in this in this particular tech preview release the the mtu um that the data plane expects needs to be at least uh like 40 1960. I think we did a survey of the clouds, um, and I think I think um, the Google Cloud has the lower uh, the lower MTU. So we picked the right value for that, um, but you can't change it to a lower value if you need to. Um, if people are wondering how I had some slides that had uh, like 9,000 MTU on them, um, the MT MTU in the kernel is quite a complicated. Uh, concept. So um, the MTU on your like ETH0 device, your kind of main networking device on the host can be higher than the, the VETH device and the kernel has um, offload mechanisms where the, the, um, the MTU that you're setting for Calico is not actually relevant on most packet paths. So the it will actually send a bigger packet and then the network card will chunk it up or the um, or Linux will chunk it up at the very last second um, before it leaves the host. So uh, MTU is quite a complicated topic, um, but we've we've configured a sensible default. But the, the main problem is you can't change it to anything smaller if you need if you need to have it smaller on your particular hardware uh, in BPF mode. Um, it uh, the uh, the config parameters just not implemented yet. Okay. Um, and the uh, and, and the last question that we have is, um, uh, uh, can you detail how are you able to maintain latency with eBPF? Yeah. So um, the the main way that we get lower lower latency is to um, skip um, big parts of what the kernel would normally do for for packets that where that's appropriate. So um, pod to pod traffic and that kind of thing. So we, uh, we skip a bunch of the processing, we skip IP tables, we skip um, uh, the, we do the routing um, calculation using a, a, a BPF helper and so on. Um, so a bunch of that gets skipped. Um, and um, we've optimized our BPF programs so that for the, for the mainline case, so after your initial handshake, when we do all the policy calculation, um, subsequent packets get handled with the minimum number of um, BPF map lookups. So a map lookup is how, how a BPF program can store data and, and look it up later. 
So we've minimized the number of, of map lookups, which are the most expensive thing that a BPF program does. Um, so yeah, that's, those are, those are the things that we've done really. Um, tried to keep the BPF program as efficient as we can um, and uh, skip anything that we can. Um, one impact of that is if you have your own IP tables rules, they may not be honored if you have BPF mode on. So you need to be aware that, that you know, that's a price you're paying to, you get the more efficient data path, um, but we're, we're more efficient because we're skipping some, some operations, so. That's great. Well, Sean, thank you so much um, for taking the time to talk about this and, and, and tell, tell us about eBPF and Calico's implementation of it. Um, I also want to thank the CNCF for hosting these webinars and giving us the chance to talk about some of the, you know, the exciting work that's happening within the project. Um, and I also want to thank every one of the attendees um, who came and listened. It's, it's, to me, it's, it's personally exciting to see the level of interest in this new implementation. Um, and uh, and the project and everyone is part of the Project Calico community, and we want to encourage you to to ask questions and stay involved. Um, ProjectCalico.org, on Twitter at Project Calico, um, through the Project Calico uh, GitHub repositories, as well as on Slack and on uh, on Discourse. Um, so thank you, everyone, and uh, we also have. A list of references at the end of the slides um, that talk a little bit more about eBPF. Um, so if you go and you download the slides, you should be able to access those also. So thank you everybody and uh, have, have a fantastic week. Thanks so much Sean and Chris for a great webinar. Um, a reminder that we'll have the recording and slides posted on cncf.io slash webinars later today so you can find the slides there. Um, thanks again and hope to see everybody at a future webinar. Have a great day everybody.